Uh, several questions. Uh, simplest question came from Param, who says, uh, shouldn't we say semicolon, say, here? Uh, we can, but we shouldn't. Not every semicolon should be put in. So uh, basic rule to remember that you have to have a semicolon at the end of structs and classes. Otherwise, the error messages you will get, you will never understand. And that's basically the end of your life, as you know. So remember, this semicolon is not negotiable. The one before and if. If you don't put it, you will regret it. Statements in C++ contain delimiter. It's not, semicolon is not a separator, but a statement terminator. This is, this is complicated, but uh, therefore, things like functions do not require, function declaration do not require semicolon at the end. You could just put a list of function declaration one after another without <laughs> separators. It just works, all right? Um, you wrote template class or template type name T at the top. Yes, I did. Does it still apply below the semicolon? I do not understand what the question is, so I cannot answer. Declaring template type name T gives some meaning to um, uh, T in the struct singleton um, context there. Does it continue to have meaning after the semicolon, after the struct? No, 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 no. Uh, all the sort of, in general, this creates, uh, if you like, a block. And out at the end of the block, which is the semicolon at the end of the struct, T is gone. It's no no longer there. This is not a macro. It's not. It's it's a it's a block, right? So T is defined inside the block. So the end of the block is the end of the struct. But this is a very good question. So the the second question was, and oh, I love this question because I have been asked it so many times, even during interviews. This is the typical, if you interview for a job, you have a manager who knows nothing at all about programming or C++. What does he ask you? One question which he knows he should ask. What is virtual function? No. No, it's close, but no cigar. He says, why should you have, always have to have virtual destructor? Why should you make your destructors virtual? And this is a frightening thing for me because, you know, I lived my life till now without ever making a single destructive virtual. And believe it or not, most of my destructors are part of the standard library. So how come? How come? So, uh, and of course, you know, all the great authorities on C++, such as Scott Meyer, who people sort of think really uh, invented C++, uh, and he writes books, effective C++, effective STL, effective everything. So he tells you, always declare destruct is virtual. OK. He's wrong. It's as simple as that. He's wrong. Uh, you have to figure out what you do. Here what we do, we want to create, take the IT and put it in a struct. What do we want to do? We want to do the minimal amount of stuff. How how much will the size of the thing increase by? Zero, right? It has no overhead, guys. This is the wonderful thing about singleton. It's of the, what is size of singleton, of t? The same as size of t. Is it good? Yes, I think it's wonderful. Because you might have heard of things called arrays. You put many things in arrays. And if, for example, the signal is an int, and you put this virtual destructor there, what will happen? The size will dramatically grow. Right? I don't know. I mean, 
And why would I put virtual destructive? Because some really crazy person would want to inherit something virtually from this. All he needs counseling. <laughs> I mean, what? There is nothing virtual here. It shouldn't have virtual destructor either. So again, this is this is something very basic. And you say, well, Alex. What do I know? Well, you, I know that not a single class in the standard library does it. So, yes? Uh, could that be also understand this as uh, uh, in the reverse way? So if you don't declare uh, destructor as virtual, that is a signal to tell people don't inherit from this. Class. Yes, absolutely. And we're not building it to inherit. I mean, OK. As you all heard, or should have heard, C++ is a multi-paradigm language. What it means is once upon a time, it was object-oriented language. And then some people uh, chased it away, object-oriented, <laughs> and said you could program differently. And I am showing you how you could program differently. If you program in an object-oriented way, then many good things might happen. I don't know what they are. But you are not going to be efficient. As Bjarne Strustrup, you might have heard of him, used to joke, he would say, what are object-oriented systems? He will say, these are systems with slow graphics. <laughs> right? And you know, if you go through all this virtual stuff, it is going to be slow. Replacing plus plus on an int with virtual call is a wonderful idea. You could do it. But you see, plus plus is really fast. And virtual function call is really slow. And as time progresses, plus plus is getting faster and faster. And virtual function is getting slow and slow. The spread is growing. Right? And what we're, we're not going to address any parts of C++ in this course, which slow the computations down. Right? So if you want to learn about virtual, somebody else. You know, I'm sure there are lots of people here who would gladly advocate object-oriented programming, but I'm not one of them. You know, I'm, you know, I destroyed my career by, by becoming the sworn enemy of object-oriented a long time ago. Right? So this is not a populist, was not at least when I started it, it was crazy stand, even among C++ people. But I'm the sworn enemy of that stuff, so don't ask me questions about virtual functions. <laughs> it's on tape now. <laughs> so, so uh, okay. There might be some circumstance where they they're helpful. I'm yet to see one. You know, I'm not denying that it's theoretically possible to find a good piece of code written with virtual functions. I'm just stating the fact. I haven't seen one yet. So. Uh, I'm entitled to a private opinion. So, OK, we're done. There was one more question. Virtual semicolon, there was one more question. Yes, OK. Uh, in the assignment operator, do we have to watch out for x equals x? How? Why? Well, something, another thing Scott Meyer said is, is, is always. Yes. OK, you know, there are ladies present, so I cannot tell you everything I think about this book. But here, let us think about it. Do you need to? Do you need, I mean, if you use int, you know, int, do you check when you write a is equal to b, do you check the addresses are different? You don't. And it works somehow. It work, will work here, too, because observe what will happen. This is. There is some, you know, with problem with Scott Meyer is that most of the stuff he says makes sense in some limited circumstance. Except he never tells you what it is because he doesn't know. You know, why doesn't he know? Because as far as I could ascertain, he never wrote real code. I mean, he just lectures to you how to write code. So, and, you know, make good money. This is this is clearly so. I'm not I'm not a fan. Let let me be very very clear. 
so no, you don't need to check because just think about what will happen if they are equal. It will just, this x will evaluate, sort of x value will evaluate, it will assign back to itself. You say, oh, it will do extra work. That's all right. Why is it all right? Because checking you will be doing every time, while occasional extra work you will be doing only in rare circumstances where assigning, right? Sort of, you don't want to optimize the case, which is once in a blue moon, while slowing every case. And believe it or not, when you look, when we will be doing timing experiments, the terrible cost is conditional. Conditionals are very, very expensive and getting to be more and more expensive. Assignments are getting to be free, meaning processor could schedule them in parallel. There is just enough hardware to do that. So don't break the pipeline. Right? So in, 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 in some sense, no. This is what, by the way, and then the final argument, the compiler, remember, this is the guy which could be implicitly declared, right? Compiler is not going to generate the conditional because compiler writers don't read Scott Meyer, fortunately for us. So this is, but by the way, you might, I come somewhat strong on this, but let me explain. There is sort of, I read code. I read code here, day nine, and I see layers and layers of stuff done by disciples of Scott Meyer. So this is why I come so strong, because I have to send this message, guys, stop. You have to learn to think, because he, he doesn't, he just gives you this, whatever the number, 173, whatever. Rules, if you follow, the code will be good. No, you have to think, then the code will be good. So I'm not trying to tell you, by the way, this is not a course on <coughs> recipes. I'm trying to show you even here what is going on, why we're doing it, what the, right? And we will get more and more into sort of what is the meaning of this stuff, even, even now. Right, so now we get, and this is, this is very important stuff, we get to regular, and what, what distinguishes regular from semi-regular? Equality. Equality. Right? And again, of course, from my point of view, it's a very sad thing that equality is not automatic in, in, in C++. But this goes back to C. You see? There are very many problems C++ inherited from C. C is a very great language in some respects. But it also was a homegrown thing without some particularly deep thinking about stuff. Uh, you know, initially, for those people Tom might remember, they, well, first they didn't have structs, then they had structs, but they couldn't pass them. Structs were not copyable. There were no <coughs> copy construction. I mean, there's no term like that. You couldn't pass them as arguments. You couldn't assign them. Then they fixed the way and say, we could pass them. And they said, we'll just copy the bits, you know, and things would work. And then, of course, the question is, if you could generate assignment, if you could generate construction, could you generate equality? Equality is defined for all built-in types, right? Defined for int, for double, for short, for char, for pointers, right? For all the built-ins, you have equality. So if you have struct, how could you generate equality? Suggest a simple way, somebody. Yes? Huh? I mean, two things are equal if all their members are equal. That's what it means, right? It's sensible rule. Could a compiler do it? Yes. So I always wondered. Uh, somehow I never managed to ask Dennis Ritchie about it. 
But as probably the second best person in the subject, Steve Johnson. Uh, because he sort of was the guy who actually implemented all these assignments for structures and things like that. And Steve told me, you know, but it was very hard because, you know, the padding might not be equal. And if you compare bit by bit, things which are sort of equal wouldn't be equal. Well, yeah, this is so, but why should you compare bit by bit? You should do recursive member by member, as, as we discovered. But what happened is that C didn't do it. C++, okay, at least in my case, I have been, I started advocating sort of the synthesizing of equality about 20 years ago, maybe 25, long time ago. And I believe that by the time your grandchildren start working, there will be synthesized things. You know, it just goes very slowly. It takes forever. So we still do not have it. But let us see how we will write it. So again, what should it return? Bull. Again, C++ has a type bull, which we're supposed to return for predicates. And we will do that, and then we say operator equal, equal. But we forgot something. You see, remember we talked about we don't want this guy to be a member because we want it to take x and y, yes? x and y. How do we do it? Ah, they don't teach you that. But it's very simple. That's how you do it. If you say friend and declare it inside, it's not a member function. It's just a friend function. But it has all the access to, to all the guys. Not that we care here. But nevertheless, it is here. Uh, and then, more, more importantly, the signature is nice. If you put it outside, as some of my friends, like Param tried, you discover that you have to write well, not, uh, ugly, incomprehensible thing, right? To make it work. So never put it outside. That's the simple solution. Put it inside where it's natural and easy. So friend, bull, operator, equal, equal. Right? We always write that. And what are they going to be called? Anybody knows? But the names. X and Y. No question of that. Singleton. Ref. Uh, ref. Guys, I am an idiot. Const singleton ref uh, y. So we're almost done. What do we need to do? We need to return x dot value. Equal, equal, uh, y dot value. Everybody agrees? That's, that's the natural meaning. That's the equality. It means that if you generate two, yes? Could you make it constant? Could you make it constant? Oh, it's, no, it's an outside function. It's an outside function. It's not a member function. So. You know, no, you cannot make it constant. And believe it or not, since it takes both things by const reference, it is effectively constant, if you see what I'm saying. I mean, here the issue does not arise, we, you know. But it is effectively constant. Right? So we are done. And here comes again another complaint. So these, of course, should be synthesized. This should be implicitly declared by the compiler, but it isn't. And it's not in C++11, and probably will not even be there in C++2000. Uh, what is the next one? 14 is the next one. Uh, no chance. <laughs> Whatever. It will not be there. 
Why? Because things take forever. But here we come to something even more egregious. Now, I just define the quality. You know, and it is utterly horrible that I have to now define inequality. Because what's the meaning of inequality? Not equality. Could there be any other meaning? No, because again, it will, I mean, my, my norm, I mean, nobody will understand the things. By the way, again, in 1994, I proposed such a thing to the standard committee. I even proposed a bunch of templates which will automatically do it. They threw them out because there were people who were saying, but we want to have freedom to make the glyph not equal to do something else. <laughs> and I have no words. You know, th th this, I literally have no words. Because that you, this is not freedom. It's like saying, I want to have freedom to run on the street with no pants. No, this is not. They have it in Berkeley. An argument that you heard against that is if you can determine that something is not equal faster than you, you can determine if something is equal. Yes, uh, but let me put it like that. If you can do it, do it, but you don't have to do it, right? But the semantics must be fixed. You have absolutely no right to define inequality, which will do semantically different things. If you could do it faster, which, uh, you know, I don't know such examples, but let's come, let's say there is such an example. This is fine, but in 99% of the cases, I should be able to stop. Well, first of all, I don't even want to write the equality in this case. That should be generated. But for sure, writing inequality is preposterous. It's just, you know, why am I doing that? And we shall see it becomes worse and worse and worse, right? Because what I need to do now is literally just Control U, control K, control Y, control Y, and then I have to go and change that. And, uh, pardon me, uh, so uh, now let me write something and let me see if you will approve of it. Will you approve of this? Why not? I should be calling the other one. That is, this is the correct thing. Why? Because you see, then this guy at least becomes totally independent on the implementation uh, or anything of the class. This is, you could then copy these four lines of code in any, remember, we're writing this general pattern. And for the general pattern, of course, what we want to say is we want to say equal equal we want to drop value and we want to negate it because we just define equality right this piece of code will always work now when you're going to take this and write your own class you'll have to think what to write here. But this just stays the way it is. Do you agree? Now, here I have, oh. there is no way I can tell you everything I need to tell you. So uh, let's just go sl slow uh, in the following sense. I will, uh, I'll not talk to you there are lots of profound things I have to teach you about equality, but I will not today. I'll just give you a rain check. Or I'll talk about it. Because I want to finish this class, this, this particular structure. So and then finally, we come to totally 
ordered. Because we could make it totally ordered. And here, let us go and fix something which we never filled here. Remember, we were talking about what are the requirements for T. And now we are having a glimpse of it. You see, T could be semi-regular, and that's the amazing thing, or regular, or totally ordered. This is an amazing example of a disjunctive concept. We don't quite know what concepts are, but on faith concepts are requirement on classes. Yeah? The way we say this class T should satisfy some requirements. And you say our T could be either this or this or this. Right? Because why does it work? Anybody know? And how, how will it all work? You see, the thing is that if T is semi-regular, we will provide all the semi-regular functions, copy, construct, destruct, yes? Um, because it's a template, it, it won't actually compile all the functions at the same time. Right. Things don't have to be defined unless they are used. This is a wonderful property on which we are relying. That is, if you give me T which has no equality, it, it is fine. It will give me singleton of T, which will have copy, constructor, and assignment, but will not have equality. If your T has equality, then it will have equality. If your T has total ordering, then it will have total ordering. That is, if T is semi-regular, then singleton of T is semi-regular. If singleton is regular, oh, pardon me, if T is regular, then singleton of T is regular. If T is totally ordered, then singleton of T is totally ordered. Do, do you see what is going on, or it's too complicated? It's not too complicated. It's just we are not accustomed to think in disjunctive way. But this is a perfectly wonderful disjunctive way. There is nothing wrong. This is sort of an old question. Uh, some of, well, at least a uh, couple of years ago, we had a workshop on concepts here uh, where Bjarne uh, Strustup and other guys came, and we were discussing how to do concepts. John attended, Ryan attended, Paul attended, Dan, Rose, who, oh, Anil attended. So, and one of the things was, do we need disjunctive concepts? And this is a very simple example of where disjunctive concepts appear. Right? The requirements of. Well, what if you added concept checking into the language? Then isn't it going to um, not work anymore? Why not? Because at the time you apply it to a type T that's only semi-regular, you know, the, the, the latter part of the concept won't, won't check. So you shouldn't rely. I mean, the, the precondition would be that T should be regular, say, or totally ordered. Why don't you want to? Of course, I will use this to check. The way it would work is each function each would have, to its, own, yeah. have its own apartment. Well, actually, these requirements come from the requirements of semi-regular, regular, and totally ordered, which, which specify these very functions which we are writing. Well, what will I write for, for the requirement for this struct? This type you have to write literally what I just said, that if T is semi-regular, singleton of T is semi-regular. Yeah, huh? that's what it says. But it is what it is. This is all I have to talk about. So with the code we've written so far, are you saying that if we make a singleton of a semi-regular type, 
employee operator will not be defined? It will not be defined. How could it be defined? If, if it's not defined on T, it couldn't be defined on structure with T. You said the compiler would, would just drop it? Compiler does not generate things till they're used for templates. That's the remarkable rule on which we could depend and will depend time and time again in this class. This is why I'm sort of doing this because it allows you to write all kind of adapters which sort of work. For example, this is why those of you who know how reverse, anybody knows about reverse iterator? Okay, one person knows about reverse iterator. But whatever, those, Anil, you know about reverse iterator. Okay, Anil knows about reverse iterator. So you will know about reverse iterators and you will see that it builds on, this, this is very important for a whole bunch of things right now which you use for, for programming. Oh, apparently not you. But, uh, okay, so let us quickly, before, uh, one promise I need to, to also say that, of course, it, we need to define what equality is. And equality has to satisfy some very basic rules, right? That is, there are some laws, equality, I mean, you know, for example, there is one great law which, on which the entire edifice of Civilization is based. It's called the law of identity. Anybody knows what it is? Exactly right. Or as Popeye the sailor used to say, I am what I am. So, I mean, you know, what? But this is one thing that A has to be equal to A, and it will be normally. Except as we will discover in the lec next lecture, I was planning to cover it here, it is not true. Our wonderful computers do not obey such law. That is, for those of you who don't believe it, try to figure it out on your own till the next lecture. But there is a fundamental case where a very fundamental case which breaks, which we will see consequences throughout the course. This is one little thing, but if you break, you know, if you break I am what I am, that's everything goes. By the way, since we started talking, the other fundamental laws of thought are the law of non-contradiction, which means A and I mean you cannot have that A and not A. And the same people break that law too, as we will observe. And the final law since we're talking about it, the three fundamental laws. Identity, non-contradiction, and no. Excluded middle. Excluded middle. Right. So this, these are sort of fundamental. Everybody from Plato all the way up to Ayn Rand, the greatest American mind, for those of <laughs> A good response. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yes. Uh, yes. So her shape spreads across international boundaries. But whatever she, whatever her political views might have been, even she supported the, the uh, law of identity. And we shall see that we break it. So we need to figure out there is deep stuff about equality. But let's quickly write totally ordered. Right? I strongly suspect that if you do th we do this, we could easily obtain at least one of them. And here comes the how many things do we need to define? How many things do we need to define for total ordering? Somebody said the correct number. Yes, four. You see, things come in groups, right? This is a very important thing. We have to assume that if we define equality, we define inequality. It's just, it's just good behavior, proper behavior. It's not good not to define. And if we define 
less. I don't know. Does it look like less? Is it correct? Or not? We should define greater. Do you agree? This, this. Because programmer cannot possibly remember which way it works. Which one is defined, which is not defined. Right? And by the way, if you define this, could you define this? Yeah. It's very, very simple. And if you define less than, what else do you need to define? Greater than, less or equal, and greater or equal. There are four of them, and we need to define all four of them. So let us at least start defining them in a simple way. So we define. And here, let me tell you the rule, which, which is arbitrary, but less arbitrary that some people might uh, think. Uh, in my code, in STL, in uh, standard library, everywhere, I chose less than as the primary one out of four. Right? Why did I do it? Because, again, I had to make some arbitrary choices. For example, I had to figure out what is the default way of sorting. I mean, you have to decide. If you just say sort without telling what is the comparison, you could sort in ascending order or in descending order. Do you agree? I had to pick one. one. Which one did I pick? Anybody know? Ascending, yes. Ascending order. Because it seems to be natural, at least for most of us. If I ask you to name a bunch of numbers, you one, two, three, four, five. Only strange people will say, five, four, three, two, one. You can't, but it's not natural. Right? It's like natural numbers go from one up. That's how they go. Well, they couldn't go any other way, actually, if you think about it. So that, that, is, that is a natural thing. So, and if you want ascending order as your default order, then you pick less than as your default out of four. But of course, all of them have to be defined. That is, this is a secret thing, in the sense you shouldn't rely on it. As a person who define a class, you have to provide all four of them. Even if you know that no STL algorithm will use anything but less. Because, sort of, I, I'm not going to use other guys, but I will provide all the guys for other people to use. That's, uh, there is a rule which one of your friends invented. What's the rule? Uh, you know the one. Like on the internet, the protocol design, you should, you should be very conservative about it. Yes, you should, you, should, you should basically assume do everything for your clients, but expect nothing from them. Right? Sort of. And that's sort of the rule. But we have to provide all four of them. So do you agree that it's really simple to write? Huh? Would you write it like that? There's no other way. And th really, that's, that's the way. And then observe that what we could do, we could now, this is the beautiful thing about this. We could just take this and make, ah, stupid me. One, two, three, four. So we got four copies. And uh, so you know that cut and paste is the main tool of programmer. <laughs> so uh, OK, this one should be easier. Anybody could tell me how we do it? Oh, gosh, you're so fancy. <laughs> I'll do it like that. <laughs> Would it work? Yes, it has. No. What do you mean, no? Yeah, it's this, this, good job, I mean, you know. This is what it means. If it's, if, 
x is greater than y means that y is less than x. That's, that's just what it means. If you like, that's the definition, mathematical definition of, you know, one relation in terms of the other. Of course, it's going to be a little bit harder for which one are we going to do? Great equal, less equal, whatever. So how will we do that? Now, first of all, we will get rid of value, right? We'll get rid of value. Do you agree with that? And then we'll get rid of x and y. Then we'll put parens around this thing. And then we'll negate it. And then we'll figure out which way to put x and y. <laughs> Do you see how it works? If you don't, you have to spend next two weeks in a solitary confinement contempl contemplating that. That's really important, guys. You, you know, any of us should be able to, to do that. It's like, yes, it is mathematics, but that's mathematics every programmer should be able to do. Of course, at some point, we'll have to figure out what ordering means. Right now, we're just looking at the syntax. There are some actions, some rules which these things have to obey. But syntactically, anybody wants to tell me the final one? First of all, we have to change, say that it is this or this. And then we get rid of value. We get rid of value. Okay, sort of, and then, anybody knows? Non, yes. Do you know what the amazing thing is? We're done. We're done, except for something we forgot a little bit. Uh, Remember we talked in the very beginning that we have a default constructor which will not be working because we will define a constructor. So one thing which we need to address, and it's a very interesting from my point of view discussion, is that we need to address how to get from T to singleton of T. And there are two ways we need to discover how we go from T to, uh, to, uh, to singleton. And let us have a bunch of functions here, and we will call them. What will we call them? I suggest we call them conversions. Aren't they conversions? <coughs> they are conversions. And they would allow us to discuss these terrible things in C called conversions, especially implicit conversions. This is a subject which I really don't want to talk about, but you need to know. So there are things in general, sort of once upon a time, people invented strong typing. We will talk about what types are later. And when they invented it, they said everything has to have a type. And you declare it, and what it is what it is. If you want to make it into a different type, you have to you have to convert it by doing some conversion, calling some conversion function. Right? Makes sense. But our friends at Bell Labs thought it was a bad idea. Tom there. He said, no, I don't want to write the conversion function. Therefore, they invented something called implicit conversion. Right? Anybody knows what it is? An example. Okay. 
vote. There's not a definition, but when you're passing, a, say, an argument to a function that takes something of a related type, it may magically call a constructor, morph it into some other ugly type. Okay, C. Tom, tell us what it does in C. It converts an integer to a float. Why did they have, anybody knows, why did these Bell Labs guys introduce such a thing? Was it because they were mad? No. It was because they were lazy. Specifically, what didn't they want to do? Oh, they had type float. The double. Or they did type checking. Why would they go and break type checking? Why did they introduce this rule which will allow you to say square root of 2? It takes a double, but same difference. Say what? No, it's absolutely unsafe. Save on typing. No, not quite, guys. Not quite. Not. You had to define, and they couldn't do it elegantly, because what didn't they have? Of course, if we were doing it now in C++, we'd say we have square root for double, we have square root for float, we have square root for int, and it does the right thing. right? And we could do it because we have Function overloading. They didn't have function overloading. They had only one entry called square root. So they had two choices to introduce square root double square root float, square root int. That would be terrible. Or And then they would have to write it because they didn't have templates. They couldn't do it. So they came up with a palliative, with a solution which sort of works, said we will just promote everything to the highest possible type, and obviously it's double. Couldn't be anything <laughs> bigger than double. Well, maybe not. Maybe they were wrong, but the rule still remains. And moreover, what happened is that when C++ came about, they couldn't just reject the legacy of C. Because one of the deals was that C++ compiler had to compile the entire Unix code base. And there was only one place where it broke, actually, the famous uh, problem of struct stat. Again, Tom probably remembers it. In Unix, there is a function called stat. Uh, not uh, system called stat, which returns struct stat. But you see, it cannot be in C++. In C++, the structs and functions live in the same namespace. The function stat is a constructor for structure stat, which it isn't. So they had to, to find some workaround. But generally, they had this wonderful goal of retain full compatibility with C. So they said, we will keep implicit conversions. And I wish they just did keep them the way they were in C. But then they said, oh, but we have to extend them. This is a wonderful thing, which we need to make work for any other type. Therefore, implicit conversions work for all types, and the rules are extremely complicated. So this is. The only time I'm going to mention them, and after that I'll tell you what I think of implicit conversions. So the rules are that if you have a conversion from one user-defined type to another, the function, you call a function, the compiler will look for all the one-step user-defined conversions. Fortunately, it is not going to look for two, three, four, five steps because you know, there is combinatorial explosion. And you never really know until you go through all the things that there is no path. So it looks only through one step. But the thing doesn't stop there. Because on top of user-defined conversion, 
you could put one more layer of a built-in conversion. So if you have a class which is convertible to int, and I have a function which takes double, you could give me the element of a class, and it will work somehow. And you say, oh, it's not a big deal. Well, it seems not to be a big deal, but then what happened is that people started writing code like that. Uh, okay, you're probably more familiar if I write like that. Do you know what that means? And they would write this. You say, it doesn't work. It couldn't possibly work. They're trying to write into an input stream. That couldn't possibly work, but it did. Well, not the way you think, because you see in that immemorial sort of this sort of immemorial time we got a long time ago, they figured out that C in is convertible to a pointer. Some of you might know that. And if it fails, it returns a it returns void star, but it returns null void star. So all the C++ code is full with this wonderful thing while open paren not reading from C in close paren and stuff like that. But what happens since it's convertible to a pointer? You could apply one more conversion and convert this pointer to a Boolean. And then you could convert it to an integer. And that's what happened. So sin becomes zero, and you shift it by 42 <laughs> positions. Isn't that beautiful? So, but it compiles. So uh, it is defined for 64-bit quantities. But uh, so, well. The problem is they fix this problem. They say, we will now invent things called explicit conversion. So you could say, my conversion is explicit. It will work only explicitly, yes? You might have heard about explicit keyword. We'll see it soon or next time. Guys, let me finish this story, and then I'll let you go. It's, uh, so they. They said, oh, well, we will make this conversion explicit. So this will no longer work. But then, of course, this while, uh, pardon me, while statement stopped working. So they had to break the rule. They said that explicit, explicit conversions are not going to be called implicitly unless they are in while if and other conditions which people used for input streams. So the, the entire type system was, technical term is screwed up, uh, to work around some ancient design feature. So what could I tell you? We'll be talking. We'll have to figure out how to write it. I cannot do it now, but we, I, you should try to do it yourself. And, uh, The, the sort of the, the end of the story is that avoid implicit conversions. Never rely on them. Sort of, it's impossible, as I told you, it's impossible to avoid them because even if you declare everything explicit, there are still a context in C++ where implicit conversion will be done. It's, un, you know, there is no way to turn it off. But I think that sort of you should never rely on one type automatically becoming another. There are some specialists on C++, even specialists on STL, who write, I read it, that STL totally depends on implicit conversion. This is false. I mean, of course, it handles implicit conversions. What else could it do? I mean, it lives in the world full of implicit conversions. But, you know, I am a, you know, strongly opposed to them. I think that people who are relying on them, again, introduce bug-prone code. If you know that this stuff needs to be converted, 
convert it explicitly. Always convert things explicitly. It's very important. We'll be talking about it in the next lecture. Sadly enough, I, I have to go before I finish. Well, I don't have to go. You probably have to go uh, uh, before we finish the class. So what I would suggest, I know that you don't do homework as a rule, but some of them, some of you apparently do. So those of you who do, uh, what I would suggest, I'll do it in the class, is try to finish this thing to deal with conversions. Right? To what, what, what are the things to do with conversions? This is first. Second of all, a very simple assignment, which you should be doing here in the class, but I have been talking instead of doing it in the class. We define singleton. What is the simplest thing to define after singleton? Pair. Do it. Just take this code and define pair. Figure out it should literally take three minutes, but assure that it works. And then finally, after you define pair, attempt to define instrumented using this pattern, using that. I, I don't want to use what pattern. It was used by the other guys. So using this, this stuff. Right? So all of you have this file, or should we put it? We, should, we will put it. Ryan promises that we'll put it. Well, the file which I have does compile. Oh, OK. On, you see, I, of course, cheat, as everybody. This does compile. Do you think I'm going to sit here and in the improvise without first writing it completely? <laughs> you know, I, yes. No, no, but no, no. I mean, you see, I try to do it interactively instead of just saying, this is the code, let's, let's see it. But of course, I wrote the code, and it does compile. We will assure, before we post it, Ryan and I will assure it will be posted within the next 20, 30 minutes. All right, guys, thank you. Sorry for the delay.